In the English language, the words belief and faith have slightly different meanings. If I say, I believe in you, it means I think you're telling the truth. If I say I have faith in you, it means I trust you. It's something more personal. To have faith in someone is quite a big thing. It's almost like a commitment. It's saying, I think that you are trustworthy and I want to be faithful to you. Sometimes we need to move from belief to faith, from the head to the heart, from a vague opinion to an actual commitment. You see this in the first Christians. It took them a long time to work out what they really believed about Jesus. Who on earth is this man? There's a lovely moment when Jesus seems to be losing patience with their endless discussions. They can't decide whether he's John or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So Jesus says to them, I'm paraphrasing slightly, he says, for goodness sake, what on earth do you actually believe? Who do you think that I am? And at last, Peter has the courage to say, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's a statement of belief. And for Christians in every age, their statements of belief have been absolutely central. And they've expressed their beliefs in the prayers and the teachings of the Christian tradition. But for the disciples, belief turns into faith. Faith is about a relationship, a commitment. You have to actually do something. When Peter is sinking beneath the waves on the Lake of Galilee, he has to reach out his hand and take the hand of Jesus. When Matthew hears the call of Jesus, he has to stand up, walk out the door, and leave the tax office where he is working. When the people of Jerusalem are moved by the preaching of Peter, they have to repent and be baptized. This is faith. In the Gospels, there are some things that Jesus can only do if people are willing to put their trust in him. He heals a blind man outside Jericho, and then he says to him, your faith has made you well. That miracle only took place because the man was willing to shout out and ask for the help of Jesus. And there's another passage in the Bible where it says, he could work no miracles there because of their lack of faith. He was in Nazareth, his hometown, and the people there, they were so cynical and suspicious that Jesus just walked away. Our lack of faith is like a roadblock. However much he wants to pass, he won't force his way through. Think of any classic heist movie. The opening scene is always the same. The ringleader gathers together a group of old acquaintances, usually in an abandoned warehouse, and he tells them how they are going to rob the bank. The plans to the bank are laid out on the table. There's a local street map, usually with toy cars, to tell them how the getaway is going to work. He explains to them the risks, the prize, the cut that they will take home. And then he looks at each of them individually and says, are you in? And there's a pregnant pause. Are you in? Are you ready to commit? Yes or no? Now, this is not about robbing banks, but there is a connection. Jesus says to his disciples, are you in? He says to the young fisherman, are you willing to leave your nets in the boat and follow me? He says to the man he's healed, are you willing to go home to your friends and family and tell them what the Lord has done for you? He says to all of us, are you willing to take a step and to show that you trust me? This is the meaning of faith.
how I trust someone is through the vibes I get from them. I'm very sensitive to people, I would say. So I think I'm very sensitive to the vibe or the energy that they give. And some people I won't trust ever in my life, and some people I would. I think it's just an instinct. I don't think there's a rational reason. I don't think we gather evidence before we decide to trust someone. There's something deeper inside that makes one do that. I think if I see someone do something kind, it's a lot easier to trust them. Um, also, if, if we can share a laugh uh, pretty quickly on in the interaction, that makes things a lot easier, yeah. I would say their political views. So if, if they have political views that are closer to mine, I might trust them more. But even if they have different political views, if I know them um, from my family or from some friends, I might trust them. I think the way they behave, you know? Sometimes, I don't want to judge people, but sometimes I look at someone and I'm not that trust, you know? I think it's the connection that I have with them. I can't always explain it, but I just naturally feel some people are more reliable than other people. I, I, I think it's just something that's beyond the physical realm. It's just the way I feel about people. Let me explain the switch your brain off theory of religion. In this theory, religion is about blind faith. You just jump in. You switch your brain off, hence the title. You mindlessly accept whatever teaching your religious leaders give you, and you practice your religious faith without any understanding or rational discussion. Now, this is not Christianity. And in fact, I don't think it's many other religions either. Christians are required to use their intelligence to examine the evidence and to look at things critically. And so Christians believe that there are good reasons for believing in God and good reasons for believing in Jesus Christ. Now, you might say to me, OK, then prove it. And I'd reply, well, maybe you're looking for the wrong thing. I can give you lots of evidence, but maybe not some cast iron proof. And this gets us to the heart of the matter. Christianity is about rational evidence, but not necessarily scientific proof. They're both important, but they're not the same thing. In science and mathematics, you need proof. I can prove to you if I have the skills that two plus two equals four, that light travels faster than sound, that gravity is working here. But in many, many other areas of life, what, what you're looking for is evidence, not proof. And if you find enough good, solid, trustworthy evidence, then it will lead you to the truth. Science is science. It's amazing. But it only takes you to one kind of truth. Think of ordinary life. How do you know that someone loves you? Well, you can do the data analysis. You can work out how many times they've smiled at you in the last week, or how many times they've said, I love you, in the last month. I hope there are some good signs that they love you, but you won't find scientific proof. How do you know that you can trust someone? Well, it's partly intuition, it's partly experience. You have good reasons, even if you can't actually prove it. I'm watching season two at the moment of The Good Wife. It's a classic legal drama. There's a courtroom scene in every episode and a lot of family and politics in the background. And at the end of every episode, the judge looks at the jury and he asks them to give their verdict. He wants to know what judgment they have come to that is beyond reasonable doubt. It's such an interesting phrase, beyond reasonable doubt. It means you've got every reason to believe it, even though you can't actually prove it. I remember going to an exhibition at Tate Modern in London by the artist Matisse. There were these huge paper cutouts, some of them taking up a whole wall. And I was getting in close and looking at some of the individual shapes and the colours. Beautiful, intricate in themselves, but they didn't quite make sense. 
And it was only if I stepped right back, even to the far wall, that I could see the whole. I could see how it fitted together. It made sense. I could see the beauty and the harmony and the picture in itself. Very often when someone starts to believe, it's not one single thing alone. It's many different things coming together. It's thinking about the existence of God. It's reading something in the Bible. It's learning about the life of Jesus. It's the goodness of a Christian friend, an experience of suffering, a glimpse of beauty. It's a deep sense of gratitude for something. It's a coincidence that seemed to have some meaning. It's a prayer that somehow was answered. These may seem to be small things, but when you put them all together, they point to something much bigger, to the goodness of God, to an intuition that he has spoken to us in Jesus Christ. Yes, you need logic and reason, but they will only get you so far. You also need wisdom, understanding, intuition, insight, vision. You need to step back to see the whole. When I put all the evidence together, I see something that makes me want to believe. Maybe there is no mathematical proof, but there is enough good evidence for me to take a step forward. And in this sense, I think there are many good reasons to believe. I grew up as a Catholic, um, but as I left home and I started exploring the rest of the world, my beliefs changed and I no longer have a specific uh, religion that I choose. I believe in this or something greater, but I don't define it. I was brought up as a Mormon. My father's Mormon bishop. Um, I was brought up in the Mormon church, which is very uh, holistic, uh, all-encompassing, uh, every aspect of life defined by Mormon church's beliefs. I grew up Catholic, um, so, you know, we went to Mass every Sunday. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and um, that after I died, I would, you know, hopefully go to heaven uh, and that that's where all of my dead relatives were, so, yeah. We as Church of England, not that I've really ever gone to church a great deal. My mum would drag me to Sunday school if I wasn't playing football. Most of the time I was playing football. I grew up as a, as a Hindu and there isn't one set of edicts in Hinduism, it's a series of schools of thought and the ones I learned came primarily from my father so he might have made them up <laughs> and I don't know but they were, they were about um, right action, not doing harm to others, not to be too attached to material things. Sometimes you hear it said that faith is a gift, and I think that's partly true. There are stories in Christian history when someone's life is turned completely upside down. It wasn't part of their plan. The Holy Spirit often surprises us. Perhaps the most famous story is the conversion of St. Paul. He was on a journey towards Damascus, and he saw a light surround him that seemed to come from heaven. He fell on his face and he heard the voice of Jesus speaking to him. This man was an enemy of the church, but through this unexpected meeting with Jesus, he was given the gift of Christian faith. But sometimes faith feels more like a choice than a gift. And I actually think this is more common. We can see a lot of signs, but we need to say yes, we need to take a step of faith. And in fact, God invites us. He never forces our hand. He appeals to our freedom. My favorite image of this is a painting by Caravaggio called The Calling of St. Matthew. 
Jesus is on the far right of the picture, pointing to a group of tax collectors. And Matthew, as I understand it, is the young man sitting at the table, counting his coins. His shoulders are hunched over, his head is bent down. He's half heard the invitation, but he's still lost in his own thoughts. He doesn't want to look up. He's not sure where it's all going to take him. It's as if the whole world is waiting to see how he'll respond. There are moments when faith requires a choice, when you need to make a commitment despite your uncertainties. It's the same in many areas of life. If you like someone and you want to get to know them better, you have to take the risk of actually talking to them. If you want to get a job, you need to take the risk of putting in the application and then the risk of going to the interview. These are calculated risks. It's not about blind faith. I remember taking a step of faith when I was 17. I'd been reading a bit about Christianity. I'd gone to church once or twice with some friends, but I was definitely an observer and not a believer. I used to sit on the back row of the church with my arms crossed, determined not to get too involved. But then one evening at home, something in me felt drawn to pray. I certainly wasn't comfortable, but it felt like a risk that needed to be taken. And I remember actually saying, oh God, I'm not sure if you exist, but if you do, please help me. Now that might sound illogical, but I don't think it was. The reality was I half believed, and with that half belief, I made half a prayer. It was a really important step. Something changed for me. It was as if it unlocked a door from the inside, and over the next few weeks and months, that door slowly began to open. We are all invited to take a step of faith to believe in a loving God, to believe in his Son, Jesus Christ, to believe in the gift of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, you might not feel ready for this, but I'm simply inviting you at the very least to be open to the idea of taking a step in faith. What does this actually mean? What does it look like? It might be to share your questions with a Christian friend, to read the Bible, to visit the church, to learn more about the Christian faith. These are little steps. They can be signs of faith. Or it might be to make a prayer of faith, even a very simple one. You could do this right now in your heart, or maybe later when you're at home. To say something like, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Or, Jesus, please help me. Or, Dear God, please give me the gift of your Holy Spirit. I promise you to take a small step in faith, to say a simple prayer like this. It will make a real difference. It will allow God to work in your life in a new way. It could be the beginning of the most amazing adventure of faith. So I left uh, the job that I had back in 2015 uh, without having another one lined up. But for me, that was a step of faith. I genuinely believed that I was being called to do something else. And I remember uh, people at my workplace, uh, you know, some of them really wished me well, but some of them kind of looked a bit apprehensive and thought, you know, or expressed I, they wouldn't do it if they were in my shoes. Um, but I did, and I ended up having a fantastic couple of months. So I worked in Mauritius for an education organisation, um, which was wonderful. And then when I came back, I started um, work with an education charity, uh, which I really enjoyed at the time. But 
throughout that process, I prayed quite a lot about what my next step should be. And I think part of having faith is knowing that there's uncertainty and not knowing what's going to happen next, but being confident that Jesus will be there in the future and that God has our futures um, in hand and that he's looking out for us and he wants the best for us. I love my Christian faith because it's a source of joy, because practically it encourages me to be uh, the person that I'm called to be. Um, I think to know Christ and to know who he is means it has implications for how I should be and how I should treat others. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely that source of joy is, is the first word that comes to mind when I think of my Christian faith.